session of uh, Contribute Student Talks. We start with uh, Noah Saylor from Berkeley University, removing extragalactic foregrounds in CMB lensing reconstruction. Please. All right, uh, so thanks. Um, my name is Noah, and I, before I get into removing foregrounds, I, I uh, very briefly want to quickly motivate um, you know, why CMB lensing, why is it interesting. So as I'm sure Blake will talk about in more detail later this week, uh, CMB photons are, are lens or the intervening matter uh, as they traverse the observable universe. And we can use measurements of this lensing um, to learn about the late time structure evolution. Um, now in the weak lensing limit, uh, this lensing is completely determined by this uh, deflection field, alpha. Um, and I'm working in the, the flat sky approximation here. So x is some 2D coordinate. And conventionally, what we measure with the CMB uh, is not alpha, but it's um, divergence, which we call the, the lensing convergence. Uh, and now is a particularly exciting time to be doing CMB lensing, um, just because we're in a, a, a phase of rapid advances and sensitivity. Um, so in this plot here, in black, I'm showing the convergence power spectrum. And I'm showing some noise curves for some various surveys. Kind of the current state of the art is this curve in red uh, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And in the next decade or two, uh, we're going to be decreasing these noise levels by something like a, an order of magnitude with CMB stage four. Uh, OK, but how do we actually um, measure this lensing convergence? So as a starting point, uh, recall that statistical isotropy forces the two-point correlation function in Fourier space uh, to be diagonal. Um, OK, so now let's imagine doing the same thing. So we're going to average over realizations of the CMB, but we're going to fix the lensing field. Okay, And by fixing the lensing field, we inherently break isotropy. Uh, and so this two-point correlator that we were just looking at uh, ends up picking up off-diagonal contributions that are proportional to this lensing field. And this is our starting point for deriving an estimator uh, for this lensing convergence. Um, OK, so if I have this equation, I can divide both sides by kappa. And there we have it, I have an estimator. Um, it's perfectly unbiased if I'm allowed to do these realizations over the CMB. But of course, I can't actually do a statistical ensemble over the CMB. But what I can do is I can do spatial averages. And so we're going to sum over multipoles that are separated by a common capital L. And by doing so, we obtain an expression um, that is a generic quadratic estimator, which has some weights uh, capital F. And these weights are, in principle, completely arbitrary as long as they're properly normalized. And traditionally, what people do is they choose these weights to minimize the variance of this estimator. OK? These estimators start to run into problems uh, when your maps are contaminated with foregrounds that are both non-Gaussian and also correlated with the lensing convergence. So specifically, what I'm thinking about here are extragalactic foregrounds, so things like the cosmic infrared background, uh, radio point sources, or the thermal or kinetic sunyev zeldovich effects. Um, so for simplicity here, let's just consider the simple case of a single foreground S. Um, these uh, quadratic estimators are bilinear in their arguments. So if I write down some estimator for the lensing uh, power spectrum, I can expand it as so. The first term here is the signal you're going after, so that's great, that's what we want. And then these remaining terms here are biases that are resulting from, in the first case, a, a non-zero bispectrum between this lensing field and the foregrounds. And in the second case, uh, from a non-zero trispectrum in the foregrounds. And likewise, you end up getting biases to cross-correlation measurements. So let's say I want to measure my lensing map, and then I want to cross-correlate it with some galaxies. I end up uh, producing some biases due to a non-zero bias spectrum uh, between these foregrounds and the galaxies. And for an act like survey, uh, it turns out that these uh, foregrounds are quite statistically significant, and as a result, are, are one of the leading um, systematic errors in uh, future CMB lensing measurements. So how do we get around this? Um, so the first approach that I want to talk about is uh, the so-called bias hardening technique. And the basic idea behind bias hardening is very simple. Um, so just as we can write down a uh, quadratic estimator for the lensing field, we can also try and write down a, lens or a quadratic estimator for the foregrounds. And if you have this foreground estimator, then what you can do is you can try and subtract off the bias that you would get to your naive lensing estimator using this foreground estimator. And I'm going to skip most of the details because I don't, I don't have time. Um, but more or less, you just take some linear combination of these naive minimum variance estimators. And the only inputs that go into deriving this bias hardened estimator are the foreground bias spectra and power spectrum, which are straightforward to evaluate if you assume some simple halo model for these foregrounds. OK, so how, how does this actually work, or how well does it work? So in this left plot here, I'm showing uh, the simulated biases that we expect from a cross correlation measurement of uh, CMB lensing with an LSST like set of galaxies. 
And red here are the biases that you get from the standard minimum variance estimator. And blue is what happens when you do this point source hardening. And you can see that you reduce the biases by something like a factor of 10, so that's quite nice. Uh, and this plot on the right, what I'm showing is how well you can measure the amplitude, so the fixed shape amplitude of this cross correlation as a function of the smallest scales that I include in my lensing reconstruction. Oops, sorry. Um, and the color here is showing the relative bias to this measurement in units of the statistical uncertainty. And so you can see here that for the standard minimum variance quadratic estimator, which of course has the highest signal to noise, uh, you can see that the QE becomes overwhelmed by bias at a L max of somewhere around 2200. So this is the point where the systematic error starts to dominate over um, the statistical one. Uh, whereas something like a point source hardened estimator can go to much smaller scales uh, while retaining a, a smaller bias. And so at the end of the day, by including all this smaller scale information, you can build an estimator that actually has a lower noise and a lower bias uh, than the standard uh, QE. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about bias hardening. Um, the other technique that, that is more commonly used uh, are multi-frequency techniques. So typically these CMB telescopes are measuring the CMB at mul multiple frequencies. And I'm always free to take any linear combination of these frequencies, as I would like, to obtain some linear combination t hat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of freedom in what these weights can be. So traditionally, what you do is you choose these weights to minimize the variance of t hat. But what you can also do, if you know the spectral dependence of some of these foregrounds, is you can modify these weights to try and deproject them, to remove them from this map t hat. Uh, and there are some subtleties that uh, we'll get to in the next slide. I'm going to skip this because I don't have time. Um, so here are uh, some results. So on this y-axis here, I'm showing the bias to the amplitude of that same cross-correlation measurement as a function of the noise. These different colors here are showing different types of estimators. These circles here are showing what happens when I use the minimum variance uh, linear combination weights. Uh, and then these squares or triangles are showing what happens when I try and individually remove either the CIB or the TSC. And counterintuitively, when you remove the CIB, you actually end up increasing your overall bias. And likewise for the TSC, and that's because you end up boosting the other's power spectrum. Um, and so this is a bit counterintuitive, and it's kind of the worst case scenario because you've increased your noise and your bias. Um, this purple here is showing what happens for the, the bias hardened estimator. Again, your noise is below your bias, so that's good. But let's say you want to be more conservative or um, get your bias below maybe half a sigma or something. Um, instead of jointly deprojecting, you can do a, a semi-clever trick where you just draw a line between these two different types of weights. And so by walking just slightly along this line, you can pay a 20, 10% noise price instead of a factor of two and, and still have an unbiased estimator. So I'll leave it at that and say that we'll be using this techniques for a cross-correlation analysis of Debye and Act in the near future. Thank you. Questions? None? Oh, from Zoom? Okay. <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Noah again. Next one is uh, Aparajita Sen. Hi. Okay, it's online. Should I share my screen? Yes, thank you. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, you can, you can start. Okay. Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Aparajita Sen. I'm a PhD student at ICER Tiruvananthapuram, India. And today I will talk about this topic, Forecast for Recovery of R in CMB Bharat. I will specifically focus on thermal dust complexities and, its, uh, and the optimum range of frequency required for its removal. 
So I have done this work in collaboration with Devagrutha Adar, who is a postdoc at IMC Chennai, and my supervisor, Swamin Basak, Jack Delabroli, and Tuhin Ghosh, uh, and others. So before uh, I start, let me uh, let me just briefly tell you what is CMB Bharat. CMB Bharat is a fourth generation satellite mission, which is which has been proposed by the Indian cosmologic uh, co Indian community of cosmologists to our space agency ISRO. The proposal was made in 2018, and since then it has been under consideration in the in our space agency. So CMB Bharat will have a multitude of science goals such as the measurement of the neutrino masses, and then uh, measuring um, um, then observing the galactic magnetic field and the thermal dust, etc. But uh, um, the one of the main uh, key scientific uh, goal is the measurement of the primordial C CMB B mode, and uh, it aims to detect uh, the C CMB B mode at a tensor to scalar ratio of 10 to the power minus three. At a confidence level of three sigma, so uh, just let me mention here that the uh, tensor to scalar ratio R actually quant quantifies the power of the CMB B mode and is directly um, related to the energy scale of the inflation. CMB Bharat will observe the sky, microwave sky, over a very wide frequency range, starting from 28 gigahertz going up to 850 gigahertz, and it will also have a very high resolution. Uh, which is uh, from 5 to 1.5 arc minute spanning over the several frequency band. And it will have around 20 frequency band, which is almost double of what Planck had. And its sensitivity budget will also be around 10 to, uh, 10 to 30 times better than Planck. So what are the challenges in the detection of B-mode? So one of the major challenges is the high level of foreground. So as you can see from this figure, that CMB uh, Bharat aims to measure at R, R at 10 to the power minus three, which is given by these pink dashed lines over here. But the total foreground, which is given by this black line, dominates over this R by at least uh, three to four, at least two, three orders. So this is one of the, uh, this is what makes the detection of the B-mode very difficult. And that's why it has not been measured yet. So one of the so basically uh, measuring of the B mode boils down to a component separation problem, and uh, and by component separation I mean that se separating the CMB component from all the foregrounds such as synchrotron dust, pin dust, etc. And one of the uh, ways to improve the uh, improve the performance of component separation uh, separation is taking observations over a wide range of frequency or a very high number of frequency bands. Now my talk is based on these two works. One is B-mode forecast of CMB Bharat, which has been published in MNRS. And the second work, the man manuscript for which is under pre uh, preparation, which is titled Optimum Range of Frequency for Thermal Dust Removal in CMB Bharat. Now this is the, uh, so what are we aiming to do? We are, first we will test the ability of CMB Bharat to detect the primordial B-mode to make our study very robust, we consider a range of foreground components, and we also account for several thermal dust and synchrotron complexities in its modeling. Now, this next question that we ask is, uh, as we already know, that the um, frequency bands higher than 100 gigahertz are dominate, dominated by the thermal dust um, component. Now, how can we efficiently remove this component? Uh, one way is to increase the frequency range of dust observations. And we ask the question, what is the op optimum range up to which we need to observe this component so that its removal is very efficient? Now, briefly, let me tell you what is what I mean by thermal dust complexities. So thermal dust is uh, up to now for temperature and emote um, observations have been very successfully modeled as the modified black body spectra. This equation, of what I mean by modified black body spectra, is given by this equation over here, where I mean is the uh, is the intensity of the thermal dust emission. AD is a template for the thermal dust uh, emissivity, and this is the emissivity is modified by a power law over a frequency, and beta d is the spectral parameter through which it is modified. And beta D does not depend, depend on the uh, 
um, on the frequency. And this B nu is the Planck's law, which depends on the temperature of the temperature at which the dust cloud or the dust component is at. Now, this modeling is not enough for, uh, it's not adequate for the extraction of B mode. There are several, because this does not account for several forms of dust complexities, such as line of sight effects, variation in the dust composition and site, a size, and also the galactic magnetic field. And also some of these effects lead to frequency decorrelation, which means we cannot, um, the observations over different frequencies cannot be simply modeled by a power law. So to account for some of the dust complexities, we have considered three models. One uh, is the NPD sorry, dust model. Sorry to interrupt. You yeah. have one minute left. Okay. Oh, okay. So we have considered three models, which uh, which considers this type of uh, complexities, which takes this type of complexities in account. And let me just briefly uh, summarize our results. So for our forecast, we find the, uh, for the in the for simple R forecast, we find that for a very simple model, we are able to reach the targeted sensitivity of CMB Bharat. And second, for dust complexi complexity, such as uh, multi -layer, layer dust model or, or frequency decorrelation, some of uh, the parametric component se separation method, which we have used, which is known as commander, is not able to recover the dust adequately. But whereas the blind component separation method, which do not, does not take into account any form of dust modeling, uh, can uh, extract the thermal dust uh, component adequate, uh, can remove the thermal dust component adequately. And second, uh, for the optimum range of frequency channels required, we find that, uh, so uh, we find that if we consider frequency channels up to 520 gigahertz, as we have shown here in for the physical dust and MKT dust model, we are more than able to recover the required uh, tensor to scalar ratio to, uh, we are able to recover tensor to scalar ratio 10 to the power minus three. And we actually do not require the frequency channels above 520, which is going up to 850 gigahertz for this task. So uh, this is, all for my talk. To conclude, I can just go over my conclusion that uh, so we find that configuration of CMB Bharat can recover R equals to 10 to the power minus 3. And second, we also find that thermal dust observations up to 500 and 500 gigahertz is adequate for minimizing its contamination. So thanks. Let's thank uh, Aparajita. Are there questions? Thank you. Okay. There are not from Zoom either. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Oh. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, how do these effects lead to frequency decorrelation? I, what, what is the main reason? Uh, yeah, it happens because uh, so when we consider different forms, or for example, different composition of dust, for example, if we have silicon dust, comp um, so dust components can have silicon or carbonaceous. And we when we consider those things, so their um, physical properties over the frequency range changes. So, um, so in short, that is how we can get frequency decorrelation. So this is one of the way we can get frequency decorrelation. Again, in the second case, we have, uh, for example, in the multi-layer dust model, uh, we can uh, kind of model the dependency of frequency as a line of sight. For example, as a distance uh, through which we are observing. And when we do that, it is not, uh, possible to just um, model it as a power law. Um, in that case, the spectral parameter, which I showed beta D becomes dependent on the frequency. So that is how the frequency decorrelation also comes in. Thank you. 
if there are other questions. Okay. Thank you, Abarajida. Okay, next one is uh, Kumar Aritragon, EMB modes from secondary polarization of CMB. Yeah, hi, uh, am I older? Uh, okay, you can share the screen. Yeah. Okay, you can start. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Horizon, I'm a grad student at the Carter Institute of Fundamental Research, and I will be speaking about the secondary E and B mode polarization of the cosmic microwave background due to the peculiar transverse velocity of free electrons from the reionization and post reionization errors. So, so during the time of reionization, free electrons were produced in abundance and they had a peculiar velocity with respect to the CMB residue. So as you have already known that, that uh, in the, since these have a peculiar velocity in the rest frame of the electrons, the CMB is no longer isotropic. Uh, in particular, one can show that there is a quadrupolar anisotropy in the incoming CMB radiation. This is primarily due to the nonlinear nature of the relativistic doctor effect when you transform your frame from the lab to the electron rest frame, and also due to the nonlinear relation between the temperature and the intensity in the Planck spectrum. So in presence of a quadrupolar anisotropy, as you can see from this figure, uh, Thomson scattering can generate linear polar polarization in the CMB radiation. So this, this, this is called the uh, polarized kinetics and that's the Zeldovich effect. And this was first predicted in 1980 by uh, Rush Sunev and Yaku Zeldovich. And uh, some other studies have been made uh, with different aspects of, of this signal. So this is like a one page summary slide of my talk. Uh, what we have done is that we have uh, calculated or estimated a uh, angular power spectra of the EN mode, ENB modes generated due to this effect. And we have shown that this is sensitive to the central redshift of the reionization and also its duration. And it is also sensitive to the, uh, the velocity power spectrum, which is related to the matter power spectrum. Uh, if, if you consider uh, the scalar modes to be sourced by gravity. Uh, also, we have shown that uh, this, 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 uh, the spectrum, the frequency spectrum is, does not have a black body type spectrum but it also have a white type distortion. And due to that distortion, you can separate this signal from the other kinds of primary CMB signals, which only have a black body spectrum and also other type of LC signal, such as thermal LC uh, signals, which involves unpolarized radiation. And since these have a different spectral signature, it is also, uh, it is also free from the cosmic variance of the primary CMB polarization signal. So in the graph, you can see that this is the polarization signal for some fiducial parameters of reionization. Uh, we have chosen, the, and this is also, we have plotted the tensor to scalar ratio of the prim primary B modes at uh, R equals to 10 to the minus four and five. And this uh, olive curve is a prism sensitivity curve. Prism is a, a space-based experiment which has been proposed. And as you can see that uh, some more uh, sensitivity needs to be gained in the future to the, uh, to detect this kind of signal. And this Poisson term is like the contribution from uh, the galaxy short noise at redshift below. Uh, so moving on, uh, as I have told that the spectral signature is, is a, is a, is a, is a, has a white type distortion in it. This is primarily due to the mixing of photons from different direction, which has a black body spectrum, but they belong to different temperatures. And as you know, that mixing of such photons due to Thomson scattering produces a resultant spectrum, which has a, a black body part, which is this part, and there's a white type distortion in the spectral signature and X is the 
uh, dimensionless frequency, of course. And due to this, you can actually separate the signal from other kinds of uh, uh, CMB signals. So moving on, uh, how to characterize this polarization field? Of course, you use the Q and U Stokes parameters, and which is a spin two field. And uh, so, so you can uh, using uh, spin two spherical harmonics, you can split this polarization signal into its uh, harmonic coefficients. And what you can show that this polarization signal consists of a parity, uh, a even parity, and the odd parity component. So the even parity is called the emo and the odd parity is called the emotes. And this polarization field is dependent on the electron number density, which in our case is just a function of time. And it is also proportional to the square of the transverse velocity field. So what we have done is that we have found out the power spectrum of such E and B modes. And what you can see that if you bring it all together, this becomes a complicated function. Uh, this is the uh, BP uh, uh, angular power spectra, and this is actually a very complicated equation. And you have to do uh, numerical integrations to find out uh, the corresponding power spectrums. And so as I've said that this is sensitive to the central redshift organization, as you increase the redshift, uh, what happens is that the total Thomson optical depth increases, which increases your uh, signal. So as you can see, these, these blue curves are the, are the B modes and this yellow and red curves are the E modes. And they all increase as you push the central redshift of reionization to higher and higher redshift. Uh, next, it is we, we have also shown that this is sensitive to the width of the reionization. Changing the width actually has a very negligible effect on the optical depth, but still the power spectra decreases with the increase of duration. It's a simple explanation, which is like sorry, uh, as sorry you to go, interrupt. As you, you you have one minute left. Yeah, yeah, sure. So what happens is that as you increase the duration of reionization. Uh, the velocity fields that you have, there are much more uncorrelated velocity fields along your line of sight. And the polarization created from those velocity fields will have tend to cancel each other. And you can see that this effect is stronger at the smaller scales because at smaller scales, you have more and more such uncorrelated uh, velocity fields along your line of sight. So you can see that, uh, and the width of the reionization is defined as the time where the universe was uh, not reionized till to a place where it is 99% kind of reionized. That is how you define the width. And this delta Z is a parameter which characterizes this width. Uh, and this, uh, this is the same thing for the emotes. You can see a similar kind of signature in the emotes. And lastly, as you may have noticed, that the E modes are always a bit greater than the B modes. We wanted to know why is that, and for that, we kind of decomposed our uh, polarization field into scalar vector and tensor modes. Uh, as you may have known that the velocity is still a source by gravity, which is scalar modes, but at second order, all the scalar vector and tensor component is present. And what you can see that the, the scalar component do not contribute to the B modes as expected, but it has a huge contribution to the E modes. Uh, sorry, this this will be a E mode. Uh, sorry for this typo. Uh, this has a huge component for, in the E modes, and that is why we believe that the E modes is a bit greater than the B modes. So I will end by repeating my conclusions that this power spectrum, uh, this polarization has a wide distortion part for which it will be sensitive. Uh, it, you, you will be able to differentiate between other signals which have either a black body spectrum or or it involves unpolarized radiation and these are these this polarization signal is sensitive to the reionization redshift width and the matter velocity power spectrum uh, thank you thank you for your patience thank you are there questions from the audience in presence of from Zoom. Okay. Let's thank uh, again uh, Ari Dragon. <laughs> Next one is uh, Maria uh, Maria Cedric.
pointer. To go on and to go back. Sorry, sorry, the spoiler. <laughs> okay, please, you can start. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Maria, and today I'm going to talk about interacting dark energy from joint analysis in retrospace, a project we've done at the University of Edinburgh with Alkisis, Chiara, and Pedro. So, last week we all heard this fantastic talk about spectroscopic service and how they're going to revolutionize the field of cosmology. We also learned that there is this fantastic state of art perturbative theory. Uh, which is called effective field theory of large scale structures, short for uh, EFT of LSS, and it allows us to go to nonlinear scales, and these nonlinear scales they contain a lot of information about gravity. So you would think, okay, we have the best we can do model, and the data is coming, so we're done, right? Not so fast, especially for extended cosmologies, like the one from the title of this um, talk. So what we have to do? First of all, of course, we have to implement it, but then we also have to run some validation tests in order to avoid false detection. We also introduce new parameters in our parameter space, which is not small, and you will see it in a moment. So we introduce extra degeneracies, which can be a problem, so they have to be started. And last but not least, with a lot of data, we need to know what we are looking for, like which observables we want to model, and which of them contain the most information we need to constrain our gravity. So. That's the ambitious plan for this project. And our pipeline is just a classical validation test pipeline where we, where is the pointer? The pointer? The pointer, yeah. Uh, so we had the MCMC sample and we feed it with priors and Gaussian likelihood. Uh, and for the Gaussian likelihood, we constructed from the standard cosmology simulation, 300 of them, with um, covariance with 10,000 MOOCs, constructed from 10,000 MOOCs. And also for the model, we use EFT of LSS, but with modification, oh, with modification for uh, interactive dark energy. So uh, we look at the posteriors, and uh, from this posteriors, we construct two statistical properties. One of them is called figure of merit, which basically says how good we constrain our extended parameters. And the second called figure of bias, which says how biased we are from the fiducial values from the standard cosmology. So let's very briefly go through the effective uh, field theory of large scale structure. So if you want to construct uh, your power spectrum in relative space for, uh, up to one of order, what you need is this set of parameters. So first line is for the bias expansion, then you have some bunch of uh, counter terms, and then you have a scale dependent shot noise. And of course you also have the growth rate, the logarithmic growth rate with respect to one pole, which is like the parameter to test gravity. So, if you look into the formalism, you could see directly from the equations that this bunch of parameters is already degenerate with one another. So for example, B1 and F, so these guys, they're degenerate because they both control the amplitude. Then the uh, um, non-local biases, they're also degenerate. And even if you use only the power spectrum, it's not enough to constrain B gamma 3. Also, to constrain all the three of the first Kante terms, you need all three multiples. So. What we want to do, we want to include bias, bias spectrum. Uh, for bias spectrum to stay consistent, we go only to a tree level, so a little bit less parameters, but still there are the generalities between F and B1. Uh, however, if you use only bias spectrum measurements and you put on top on your, of your monopole uh, bias spectrum quadruple, it's already enough not to break the generalities, but to constrain B1 and F. Okay, so. We want to do a joint analysis, so a lot of things going on. We then move to the growth rate, which we parameterize in our interactive dark energy formalism. As it is clear from the name, dark energy is interacting, it's interacting with dark matter. You can think about this interaction in terms of um, Thomson scattering, so there is only um, impulse transfer between these components and no energy transfer. So background stays the same. The only thing that we modify is the uh, structure formation. And you can see there is this additional term in the Euler equation, the drag term. So the parameters that are extra for this model is the uh, W, which is just the equation of strength for dark energy. And then we have the Xi. And Xi is just the ratio between the the um, cross section of the interaction uh, to the matter uh, to, to, to the dark matter particle mass. 
Uh, we also use not the parameterization of W and Xi, we use W and A, and A is just the product of those two, just because it's easy to analyze. Uh, so concentrate on these plots where I plotted the ratio for the algorithmic growth rate in our model to the standard cosmology. And the main takeaway is that we have these two forbidden regions. And these forbidden regions, they just correspond to the values of Xi, which are negative. So is it not a lot because Xi is just the ratio of two positive quantities. There are a lot of other takeaways from this plot, but we don't have time for that. Uh, so enough with theory, let's go to some results. So what we've done, we just step by step applied all our observables. We searched for the best figure of merit and the, the smallest figure of bias. Um, and uh, we vary our range of scales for that. So first of all, it was the power spectrum multiples, the low order, so the monopole and the quadruple. Then we added uh, for this best value of K max, the hexadecapole, and you can see the hexadecapole, well, it doesn't really improve a lot, but it's actually even make it worse. So then we move to the bispectrum monopole, we added bispectrum monopole, and we see that there is improvement, but it kicks in in very nonlinear scales. We also tried it to add the hexadecapole for this case, and actually it improves because it breaks like very slight degeneracies in counter terms. So takeaway, if you are using um, in joint analysis with the bispectrum monopole, uh, please don't forget to add the uh, hexadecapole in the um, power spectrum, on the power spectrum part. Okay, great. So let's look at this wonderful marginalized posterior for only the extended parameters A and W. You can see this butterfly pattern and it just corresponds to the figure you've seen before where we have two forbidden regions. And what is important that if we have the bispectrum monopole, then the contours there are tighter up to 30%. However, we go to really nonlinear scales and we need to evaluate a lot of triangles. So can we do better? Can we do, well, the same, but with least amount of triangles? Yes, we can. So first approach will be just to apply some bias relations. Again, not a lot, of, a lot of time to go into details, but you can see we can achieve the same improvement going to much more moderate scales and, scales and the second uh, improvement type is just to add the bispectrum uh, quadruple on top of bispectrum monopole. And you can see again on more moderate scales like here, we already see the uh, comparable uh, improvement of uh, our extended um, parameters constraints. So, of course, after doing validation tests, we have to repeat the same analysis with the real data, for example, from BOSS. And uh, it has been done for power spectrum multiples only. Now we're working to include the bispectrum. All in all, summary, please use bispectrum monopole if you don't want to calculate a lot of triangles. Just add um, some bias relations or uh, bispectrum quadruple. Uh, we also found very, comp very similar improvement in uh, WCDM scenario. However, a lot of work has to be done, uh, which you can see on this wonderful meme. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Nice, nice talk. Are there questions? Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, I'm sorry that you had to fit it into seven minutes because it sounds very interesting. And so, can you go back to the plot, the final triangle plot for, uh, for the other cosmological parameters? No, with the correlation, just when the final one, when you show final the one. correlation to the other cosmological parameters, or maybe you can also comment uh, on uh, what would you expect uh, these uh, parameters to be correlated with, like other the other cosmological parameters that you would expect correlation with. They definitely would. Well, the the, the work w which was done with real data and full cosmological analysis was not done by me, but but my colleagues. Uh, uh, yes, of course, there will be some degeneracies in parameter space because it will control your amplitude, right? So it will be degenerate not only with biases but also will be degenerate with a. So everything that controls the amplitude, so to say. So there will be degeneracies. Um, they probably, uh, because we can constrain bias better, the constraints will be better, but still, of course, the uh, um, dark energy parameters will be degenerate with cosmological parameters, as you can see already here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. 
just uh, if you could turn the second slide, I think it was uh, mm -hmm. after the introduction. Oh yeah, uh, it, uh, after this. Sorry. Yes, this this slide. So there is the that the uh, the energy density of lambda uh, depends on the scale factor through through the W. Mm -hmm. uh, how how is this obtained? This uh, this. Uh, so, so always, so it, it, it's the, the solution of uh, your Einstein equation. So, so it's, it's the usual cosmology, like what we've done in our. Uh, like yeah, but in, in free. Okay, so but uh, we from if we if we look at last lectures, the rho lambda is uh, does not depend on on a. It's yeah, constant. It, so how this the, what was changed in? Uh, how did we get this? Uh, so you have this expression for like all cosmological components, right? So, so it's the solution for the equation of state, right? So it depends how, how your density and your pressure correspond. Yes. So uh, for cosmological constant, we as assume, well, the solution is that W is just minus one, but it cannot be oh, minus yes, one. Oh, yes, minus one, yes. And but, a, but here is not it's minus not, one. It's not. So it's one of the models where you allow your cosmological constant um, to have the equation of state where it's not even a cosmological constant. So right, so, so it's, just, it's just, it's, it's not, not minus one. It's not minus that's one. It. It's not time dependent. It's just not minus one. Okay, okay. That's, all. that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Other? Can you uh, thanks for the for the talk? Can you say something more more about the, the bias relations that you used uh, to? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the ones we use there, um, well, the first one which works best is the uh, bias relation for uh, the uh, tidal bias, um, and it's it was derived. Uh, so both of them are fits. First, first of all, they are not. Uh, since we are fitting everything for halos, we trust halo um, simulation. So one of them is completely from the separate linear simulation. It's the uh, bias expression for B2, so for, for the second local bias. Uh, but the one that fits better is for the, um, from the excursion set approach. Yeah, so I, I don't know what specifically I can say more about bias relations here. And just to say, the simulations uh, are done with this uh, model, right? Uh, no, the they're not done with this model. That's the bias relations from standard cosmology. Ah, OK, OK, OK. So if there are no further questions, let's thank you. Let's thank uh, Maria. Then we have Gabriel Luz Almeida. Just a moment. How do I use this? Okay, go on. I can use this as well, right? Okay, this is the pointer. Okay, oops. To go back is this. Okay, and okay. So my name is Gabriel. I'm talk I'll be talking a little bit about uh, effective field theory approach to deal with the binary system dynamics. So uh, gravitational waves were, were first detected seven years ago in 2015 by the Cholago detectors. And this was, oh, sorry. This was the, uh, the so they, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, this uh, observation provided a new window to observe the universe, since now we have another way of probing uh, astrophysics. And up to now, uh, Li the LIGO-Virgo collaboration, they detected uh, 90 gravitational events. And in all these events, in all these uh, sign, uh, gravitational signs, signals, uh, the waveforms are, uh, they have all this morphology, uh, um, which encapsulates these uh, different phases of the binary system evolution. So, we first uh, have the inspiral phase, 
in which we can separate uh, the, the two objects. And then we have the merger and the ring down as uh, Tukowski was uh, uh, teaching us. For circular orbits, we can derive these expressions for the um, polarizations of the gravitational waves. And one of the most important um, quantities in this expression is this, is this phase in here, which, is, which uh, tracks the uh, orbital phase evolution of the system. So I'm uh, talking precisely about the in-spiral phase of, uh, of the system. And one, of the things, one interesting thing is that in order to model it, we need information about the uh, conservative dynamics of the system, in which we have here the energy of the system, but also we need to give information about the, dis the dissipative part, which is the, the, the energy flux emitted by the system in terms of gravitational waves. So one interesting characteristic that we have in this binary system is that we have a clear separation of scales. So we have a hierarchy of scales. Let me just move here, okay. Um, so we have uh, an orbital scale. Uh, in the orbital scale we have this, which is basically the viral, um, virial theorem. Uh, this is the, just the leading order, okay. Uh, this R is the orbital separation of the two objects. This R of S is the size of the source. So if we are talking about black holes, this is the, just the Schwarzschild radius of the, the black holes. And also we have the gravitational wavelength, uh, which we can derive this expression in here, this relation, using linearized theory uh, of gra uh, general relativity, the linearized theory, right? And we can build this relation, okay? And if we consider a non-relativistic regime of the uh, velocities, the, this, this V is the, the uh, relative velocity between the bodies, we will end up with this hierarchy of scales. So we have the, that the wavelength of the gravitational wave emitted is much larger than the orbital separation of the objects, which in turn is much greater than the, the radius of the objects, if we are talking about compact objects like black holes or even neutron stars. Uh, because we have this separation of, of scales, we are allowed to describe the physics of, for instance, gravitational waves using an effective field theory, the same way that for the orbital scale, we can also have another um, this description in terms of an effective field theory. In order to, to do this, we use the so-called method of regions in which we split the, the, the metric perturbations into potential modes and radiation modes. Um, ra potential modes are uh, on, on shell modes in which the, the scaling is given by this. And these uh, radiation modes are on shell modes uh, which scales according to this relation here, okay? And then for instance, if we want to uh, study the, the binary system dynamics, the, the conservative dynamics, we can first neglect, uh, at first neglect the ra rad uh, radiation modes and build an effective field theory for this uh, using the Einstein-Hilbertic um, um, Lagrangian, uh, the I, sorry, the Einstein-Hilbert action as the, the bulk action, which provides the way of uh, uh, describing the interactions, but also we need uh, an action for the particle points, um, for the black holes, which in, at this sense is described as, as particle points, okay? Since we are in, in a regime in which the orbital scale, scales are much larger than the, the, way, the, the size of these objects. And then we start by um, adding operators in, in here. Um, the first one being um, just the minimum coupling that we have in general relativity. But also we can add spin degrees of freedom, we can uh, include finite size effects and so on. And then in order to make the, the post-Newtonian expansion, the way that we implement this is by expanding the, uh, the propagators that we have, uh, uh, that we build using final rules built from these actions. We can expand them because as we, see, as we have seen in here for the potential modes, this quantity in here will be um, giving contributions to the power of V square, which is precisely which uh, uh, this perturbative approach is about, the, the post-Newtonian approximation. And then each of these terms 
they, they are uh, of higher order in V square. Uh, and then computing, for instance, these diagrams in here, uh, we, can prov we can compute this effective action which should be added to the Newtonian potential. Um, this gives the, the first post-Newtonian correction. If we keep, okay, if we keep the, the radiative modes, we can integrate now the, the, the small length um, scales, okay, in order to get an effective field theory. By doing this, and doing the so-called multiple expansion in order to get the physics at these scales of uh, lambda much larger than the, the octal scales, we end up with this theory, okay, in which we can compute diagrams such as these ones and uh, compute observables such as the energy, uh, the, the energy flux uh, emitted by the, by the system. Uh, other nonlinear effects can also be, be computed. Uh, we have the tail tail effects that we have um, investigated, and they are interesting because they, they have I, IR and ultraviolet divergences, which is typical of a, a classical a, a field theory in general, and we could understand this in terms of the renormalization group evolution, but also uh, one, more, one extremely important type of diagrams are these ones, in which the, uh, the imaginary part of these diagrams, uh, they, from, from them we can have information about energy flux and other observables related to uh, uh, gravitational waves. But uh, the real part of, uh, of di these diagrams, we can uh, compute, we can obtain conservative contributions coming from radiation reactions to the, di to the uh, conservative dynamics of the system. And I finish by leaving this. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask if in your action you are also, in your effective action, do you also get dissipative terms? The, the dissipative? Yes. Okay, you can put, you can put dissipative uh, terms. Uh, you can include them here. I just put the, the more uh, general, most famous ones, which are the most important, I guess. But yes, you can do that. So, uh, so in order to build this, you have to, pl you have to put all the, the types of terms that are consistent with the symmetries of the problem, which is uh, the pheomorphism variance and also heparometrization variance. So you need, you need to find um, operators and terms uh, that uh, they are consistent with these symmetries. But um, these are the... the these in here, they are the, the ones that start to contribute first. Yeah. So I, I have a, one, one small question. Can you go to the next? Uh, aren't you missing a omega or something in the last uh, equation inside the integral? No. In here? Yeah. No? Um, mm, I, I don't think so. <laughs> no, you don't? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this would be, are you sure? This I, I need to check this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, this would be the power emitted by, by the gravitational waves. Yes, right? yes, okay. precisely. Uh, yes. So in, a, in energy, yes. Yeah, okay. so in general, even, even if you are computing these um, nonlinear okay. effects, yes. You can use this. So yeah. may maybe uh, next slide. Uh, one percent. So uh, at what uh, PN order do these effects uh, appear, and are they important? Then in observations, okay. are they relevant? Yes, this is something that I would like to talk more about because uh, yeah. Time. So um, so this uh, so this type of diagrams in here they will contribute to the conservative dynamics of the system, and they start to enter at the fa the four PN order, which is the order in, in which is completely un well understood right now. And then the, the next order, the 5pn order, in which you, you also have diagrams such as these ones, but there are other uh, more complicated um, uh, diagrams that you have to include. 
This is important because at 5 p.m. is the, the first order in which finite size effects enter the description of the binary system dynamics. So basically, we need to, to understand better how to compute these kind of things because um, this is something that we are currently doing, actually, to, in order to study the, the 5 p.m. order, which is something ongoing right now. Uh, I would just ask about the Feynman diagrams. Okay. Uh, just very, very simply, uh, if uh, if you could uh, tell me about the lines uh, oh, okay. or uh, what is the vertex proportional to? Are their masses important and so on? Because uh, those should probably represent a charge, as in electrodynamics or something. You know? Okay. Um, so we have uh, in here we have two types of diagrams. Um, I mean, we have two, basically two effective field theories. One, one that I call the near zone, which describes the, the, the spiral, the, uh, the, sorry, the conservative dynamics of the system. These lines in here, like the, these two parallel lines, they, they represent the, the world line of the particles, the particles, okay? Mm -hmm. And these connections here, they are propagators, which are generated, generated by uh, the Einstein-Hilbert um, action plus a uh, gauge, uh, gauge fixing term, which I didn't mention here, okay? Um, so, so it would be, the propagator would be proportional to the metric a, uh, capital H, right? Uh, or uh, like over the... Mm, Sorry? <laughs> uh, if, if the, whether, whether the external lines, the, the full lines represent something as a fermion with one index, and the propagator is, uh, as in electrodynamics, uh, with like the the metric, or is so it or is it a scalar propagator? The, the propagator is the full uh, is the full metric perturbation that we have in here. This h mu nu, the potential modes. Mm -hmm. Okay, they come from the Einstein-Hilbert action plus the gauge fixing term, and in here we have the the coupling of gravity with these world lines. Um, I don't know if I answered your, if I answered your question. No, it's just uh, I wanted like uh, pictorially when, when mm. I don't know, when we write in QED, for okay. example. Okay, I, I uh, guess When we draw uh, two yeah. fermion lines and between them the uh, so, photon propagator, we write it as minus eta mu nu over the Okay, I guess K squared. I guess here is a little bit different because in, in this uh, elementary particle physics computations, we do not have this word line the way that we have in here mm -hmm. uh, because they are treat, treated uh, basically uh, classically. We, yeah, they are okay, not. Okay, so, so it's, yeah, uh, yeah okay, but, uh, right, right. Uh, and the vertices, uh, what are they uh, proportional to or what okay. is the interaction? So these, these vertices in here, they, they also come from, come from perturbative um, expansion of the Einstein-Hilbert equation and the gauge fixing term, um, in which, we, of course, you have to have the, the graviton is, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the turn, right? Not to build uh, expressions like this, mm -hmm. to, uh, to compute vertices in this theory. Mm -hmm. And the same way in this, uh, this radiation zone or far zone, we also have the same. These vertices that we have in here, several that we have, they are all coming from the Einstein-Hilbert equation. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, I, we can discuss later. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. There is another question from the chat. Uh, so they are asking about the significance of instantaneity approximation. Okay. Basically, in, um, in order to study gravitational waves, we have to, to expand. Um, we have to have a perturbative approach because we do not have uh, exact solutions to deal with the problem. Okay. And this is one of the ways that we, we have um, in order to basically start from the Newtonian 
potential, the Newtonian physics. And from uh, general relativity, we can encapsulate um, corrections. And these corrections can be done, uh, can be organized in terms of velocity. So these terms in here, they are all velocity square, velocity to the fourth, and so on. Um, this is simply uh, a simple, let's say, a simple way to, to work perturbatively with the description of the two-body dynamics. Yes. Other questions? Okay, let's thank uh, Gabriel again. Okay, thank you. Last one is uh, Sara Libanore. everyone and thanks to the organizer for the opportunity uh, they gave me to present my topic here today. I'm Sara Libanore, I just finished my PhD in Padova, now I'm a visiting student in Beersheba, Israel, and now I will talk about the importance of clustering analysis in future surveys of gravitational waves. Okay, before going to that, since I'm not sure you know where Padova or Beersheba are, I just wanted to show you this image. And if you want to walk from Padova to Beersheba, ICTP is on your way, so you can just go that way. The names you see in these slides are the person I'm working with, and the ones that are highlighted in bold are the ones that are important for this work. Not my favorites, but the ones that work on this topic with me. <laughs> so this is the question uh, we based on our work. Uh, we ask ourselves whether the study of future gravitational wave surveys, and in particular the study of their clustering, if, if it will be an effective tool to put constraint either on cosmology, astrophysics, or, or both, in the same fashion that is already done with galaxy surveys. Uh, in this talk, I just want to uh, give you the taste of what I mean with the words that I highlighted. If you want me to be more technical, you can ask me questions at the end. So let's start by uh, discussing the clustering. The image that you see here is uh, uh, built using uh, mock data from a simulation, from the Eagle simulation. Each of the black dots here represents a part of the dark matter content that was drawn by an initial distribution of perturbation and was evolved under the effect of gravity. And as you can see, gravity brings dark matter to form these large-scale structures that in cosmology we call dark matter halos. The dark matter halos are the most dense places in the universe and therefore are also the places where the baryonic matter falls into. Baryonic matter falls into the uh, gravitational wells of the dark matter and there they form astrophysical sources. All the blue dots you see here, these could be stars, could be galaxies. In the case of my work, they represent binary black hole mergers and in particular, the gravitational waves emitted by these mergers. So, using simulations, we can start from a, a dark matter field and we can model, assuming an astrophysical uh, model, how these sources are distributed and how they clustered uh, all around the universe and the space time. But when we go to, when we go to uh, observe data, we have to go the other way around. So we observe a distribution of luminous tracers in the sky. In my case, we observe gravitational waves. And by studying their distribution and clustering, we are interested in understanding the properties of the underlying dark matter field. And in particular, the parameter that links the clustering of these sources with the underlying dark matter field is called the bias. So the study of the bias was one of the main topics that I focused on during my work. And we developed a semi-analytical uh, model to describe how these gravitational wave sources are distributed. So future gravitational wave surveys will put constraints on this bias in the same fashion that galaxy surveys do with galaxy bias. But there is an important uh, thing to take into account. As we discussed during the lectures in these days, from the gravitational wave signal, you cannot extract the redshift. The redshift is an information that you don't have in gravitational wave surveys. How to deal with this? Well, either you assume some statistical models, some 
uh, or you see uh, an electromagnetic counterpart so to associate a redshift with the gravitational wave event, or you just forget about the redshift and you go to luminosity distance space. Luminosity distance can be measured from the gravitational wave signal and therefore can be used as the radial coordinate of your survey. If you just map the uh, binary black hole mergers or binary neutron star merger in luminosity distance space, you can just rely on your uh, gravitational wave survey without the needing of an external data set or assumption for the redshift. The other thing that I have to underline is that all the work that I am doing is based on statistics, and to perform statistical analysis, you need a lot of observations. We don't have enough with LIGO Virgo, so we have to do forecasts for the next generation of detector, and in my case, I'm working, thinking about the Einstein telescope. Einstein telescope will push the sensitivity in the observation of the gravitational waves to a level that will allow us to observe around a million of events up to redshift six or even further. So with Einstein telescope, with Cosmic Explorer, with next generation detectors, we will be able to have constraints either on cosmological parameters or on bias parameters. Since I don't have much time, in this talk I just want to focus on the study of the bias and I want to show you an application that this um, that the constraints on the bias parameters can have in the study of both cosmology and astrophysics. And the way I will do this is speaking about formation channels. So what I showed you at the beginning with the dark matter and gravitational wave survey, sur sources distribution was referred to astrophysical black hole mergers. So astrophysical black holes form at the end of the stellar evolution, and therefore they are found where also stars are, which is in galaxies. Therefore, the bias of such astrophysical black hole mergers will trace the distribution of galaxies, which in standard theory, cosmological model, etc., they form inside the more massive dark matter halos. So when you measure the bias, you expect the bias of these uh, binary black hole mergers to follow the bias of the galaxies. But cosmological models also assume that primordial black holes exist. But if they exist, they can also get bound in binaries, and if they get bound in binaries, they can merge and produce gravitational waves. So if you trace the distribution and the bias of the primordial black holes, since they form before the structure formation, their bias will be completely different with respect to the astrophysical ones. And therefore, by studying the bias, you open a way to disentangle the astrophysical and primordial black hole mergers, which is quite useful since the um, signal they emit is almost the same. Let me just, you, ju just show you this example. So here I'm assuming that the astrophysical black hole mergers have like a linear bias that evolves in redshift, while for primordial black holes, depending on the model you assume, you can always think that they have a almost constant bias. A future survey of gravitational wave events will measure a mixture of the two, and therefore the effective bias that will be measured will deviate with respect to the linear trend you expect for the only astrophysical ones, and how much it will deviate, it depends on how many primordial black holes you will see in the uh, gravitational wave emissions. So with this, you can see that the bias can help you putting constraints on both cosmology since you're probing primordial black holes, but also astrophysics, because you're probing the formation channels of, this, of these events. If you have any questions, I will be really happy to answer, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Um, at the beginning, you showed this uh, simulation Yep. populated with, with the binaries. I was wondering if there is a recipe to populate uh, the halos uh, with, the, with the binaries or, uh, or if you... Okay, so this is a very interesting question. So in the case of this image, the dark matter part was taken from uh, the Eagle simulation, which is an embodied simulation that uh, just evolved dark matter through cross cosmic time while the uh, binary black holes were um, populate using this uh, MOBSI, which is a population synthesis code, 
which some, some, somehow assumes uh, some uh, statistical distribution of the mergers depending on uh, the properties of the host galaxy, and in a statistical way allows you to populate this, uh, um, these halos or these galaxies with the, the bias, uh, with the, sorry, merger distribution. What we are doing now with uh, Matteo Peron, which is a, a student that I co-supervised during his master thesis, he's working on um, re creating a model to repopulate other simulations starting from these assumptions. So we, the, we are developing some uh, uh, machine learning pipeline in order to extrapolate these properties and make them more, uh, you know, more uh, easy to use because running the full pipeline here takes weeks. And these, by the way, were running by the group by Michela Mapelli and um, Mario Celeste Artale. Uh, and yeah, these are mainly the two ways that, that we are following for these distributions. Sorry, so just coming back to this Eagle thing, because Eagle is a full hydro simulation yeah. and it has galaxies. So the prescriptions that you were talking about they care about galaxy properties or do they care about halo properties? In the work that Michaela and collaborator did, they were based on galaxies. Right. Uh, so in particular on star formation rate, metallicity, and uh, stellar mass of the host galaxies of such mergers. What we are doing now is trying to uh, extrapolate the relation with respect to the uh, dark matter halos. Because if we, since as you said, um, you need the, the, the bridge between, of the galaxies between the halos and the binary black hole mergers at this point. But simulating all the galaxies with the full hydrodynamics, it's a mess. So we are trying to understand whether statistically you can derive properties that allows you to populate just the dark matter part of the simulation, which is way faster to, to, be, to be used and also to be run in different cosmologies or different, uh, also different uh, boxes of different sizes. So yeah, at this point, there are galaxies in beneath. So uh, black hole mergers depends on the properties of the host galaxy. But I hope we will have soon updates on the only dark matter binary merger relation. And just another comment. At some point, you just in passing mentioned that uh, th there's an issue with the binary black holes because you don't have their red shifts. There is actually a technique to statistically get redshifts of individual binaries by cross-correlating with uh, the presence of galaxies in the yeah. same volume, yeah, sure. clustering uh, redshift. And I guess the LIGO Virgo collaboration has a couple of papers yeah, yeah. doing this. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. And uh, in fact, the thing that is mostly done is to use this cross-correlation with the galaxy field. What we were trying to do is to understand whether we can use the gravitational wave surveys alone without the needing of uh, the galaxy field. In particular, because with Einstein telescope, we will go up to very high redshift where we won't have information on the galaxy field, probably. So the idea was to understand whether using luminosity distance space and assuming that we uh, marginalize over the cosmology because more or less we know through Planck or through galaxy surveys the, a good value of the cosmological parameters, if we can just uh, gave up the cross correlations and rely on a full gravitational wave surveys. But yeah, clearly the cross correlation technique and also there is this uh, clustering based analysis that is used both with radio and with gravitational waves that somehow scans the distribution of uh, a, a survey with a known redshift, such as gravitational waves, with a distribution of, in which you know the redshift like galaxies and by looking at cross correlations in the different parts of the sky, you can associate the redshift with the gravitational wave uh, events. But yeah, I agree with you that it's one way to go. Um. Other questions? Okay. I have a very dummy question. Yeah, please. At a certain point, you mentioned late primordial black holes, yeah. so, which is the difference in uh, with uh, early primordial black holes? Yeah, so here is not early and late primordial black holes, it's early late primordial black hole mergers or binaries. So the idea is that you form primordial black holes in the very early universe, radiation dominated era, and these black holes stay around and they can form binaries. There are two main channels in which you can form the binaries for primordial black holes. 
One is the early primordial black hole way, which means that these primordial black holes just get bound in binaries in the early universe during the Dora edition uh, dominated era. Okay. So they get bound at the beginning and their merger is just postponed by the fact that they are immersed in a field with other um, black holes or dark matter that um, like prevent the binary to collapse as soon as it creates because of tidal forces. These early binaries just stay around and they are part of the dark matter. So since they form very early and they are part of the dark matter, they trust the dark matter one to one mostly. So their bias is, uh, can be assumed to be around one because they are just like the dark matter. While late binaries, uh, they are forming in a dynamical way. So you have primordial black holes that just stay around and move. When they cross one next to the other, they can like emit a gravitational wave, lose energy, and form a binary dynamically. And this happens if the um, cross-section of the event is high enough. So if these two black holes that pass next to the other have a velocity which is not too high, otherwise they just cross and don't, form, don't get bound. Okay. So this binary formation can happen where velocities are quite low, which are the small halos. For this reason, the bias of the late primordial black holes binaries is around 0.5, which is more or less the bias of the small dark matter halos. And it is constant since being a dynamical process, it's not really redshift dependent. So that's the main reason. I hope I answer your question. Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Other? Uh, considering it is a tracer of the large scale structure, uh, are, are there other relevant ingredients that you can use? Like, for instance, all the bias of, uh, bias of higher order in preservation theory, like a stochastic field and so on? Uh, okay, so um, depends on what you want to do. Uh, what I mean is this. So for this work, we just relied on the on B1, uh, so the, the, first, uh, the first approximation because these future gravitational wave surveys will have uh, very poor scale localization. So you will just see the large scales. And since you just see the large scales, you won't be able to measure the higher order expansion in the bias. Okay. Uh, the work that Matteo is doing now uh, is based on simulating data, is estimating the bias on the simulations. And inside the simulations, you can access everything. So as in that case, we are including also the higher order terms of the bias expansion. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's thank Sarah. Thank you.